Hey everyone, this is Nick and I moved this video to today instead of yesterday to avoid an avalanche of people trying to spot an April Fool's joke. Although in retrospect it would probably have meant a lot more comments, so maybe that was a mistake. Anyway, this week we have the beta for Ubuntu 23.04 and all of its variants, including a brand new one that was accepted this week. We have vast improvements to the Linux mobile operating systems, like Ubuntu Touch and Plasma Mobile, and we have Italy blocking ChatGPT, but not for the reasons you might think. And I also included this segue to today's sponsor for exactly the reasons you might think. Thanks to Linode for sponsoring this video. Linode is my favorite solution to run a Linux or gaming server. It's what I use to run my own Nextcloud instance and my own only office server. The interface is super easy to use. They are affordable, they have tons of documentation online, and they have one-click deployable servers for a ton of applications or games, like Pi-hole. Pi-hole is a DNS sinkhole that filters out requests to ad-serving domains. Basically, it lets you block ads and improve network performance. It lets you actively monitor every DNS request made on your network and block requests as they come in. And you can deploy it in one click on Linode so you can ensure I stay poor. And to get you started, Linode is giving you $100 of free credit to get your own Linux server or gaming server running. To get access to that, just click the link in the description below. So, Ubuntu 23.04 Lunar Lobster got its beta release. It includes GNOME 44, the Linux kernel version 6.2, and finally the brand new installer written in Flutter that looks a bit better than the previous one, but doesn't support ZFS installs. And it should still be faster to complete an install than the previous installer. Now, for those who want ZFS, there will be a legacy ISO with the old one. Ubuntu 23.04 is also the first release to have the official Unity, Cinnamon, and Edubuntu variants. All other variants also got their beta, though, with their latest respective desktop environments and the same internals as the regular GNOME-based Ubuntu. So they will get the latest system D, Mesa drivers, and more. As per features, Ubuntu 23.04 will get mostly what GNOME 44 added. So background apps, refined quick settings, better window manager performance and Wayland support, thumbnails in the file picker, revamped settings, and a few new configuration options for disabling mouse acceleration or overlay scroll bars. In terms of Ubuntu-specific features, the dock should now show unread notification counters on app icons, the tiling assistant extension should be installed by default, Ubuntu software now should show categories for snap apps, and there are a few tweaks to the default theme and icons, although nothing that will jump at you. And of course, I'll have a dedicated video on Ubuntu 23.04 and all of its variants when it releases, and that's gonna start to be pretty time consuming because the number of variants just starts ballooning up. Now, speaking of Ubuntu flavors, another one gained official status. After Ubuntu Unity, it's now Ubuntu Cinnamon's turn. The variant has been officially accepted as a flavor, which means they meet the pretty tough criteria canonical set, like signing the Ubuntu Code of Conduct, having a large enough community, having one or more developers to upload packages on Launchpad, and generally following Ubuntu's goals and release process. It also means Ubuntu Cinnamon won't be able to provide Flatpak pre-installed, like every other Ubuntu flavor. And you might ask, what's the difference with Linux Mint, since it's also Ubuntu-based and it uses Cinnamon by default. And the main differences are in the use of Snap, where Mint does not ship that by default and actually has a pretty hostile stance towards the format, and in the various utilities that Mint ships with that are mostly replaced by Ubuntu utilities in Ubuntu Cinnamon, plus the Yaru theme and icons. And also, Ubuntu Cinnamon will get newer packages and kernel versions and drivers, since it follows the release cycle of Ubuntu with a new version every six months. Compared to Linux Mint, that sticks to an LTS release until the next one is out. So, if you really like Ubuntu, but you would prefer to use the Cinnamon desktop, then this thing is now officially supported. That's good. And if you prefer the Mint utilities, themes, and general approach to packaging, then this won't sway you. The first Ubuntu Touch over-the-air update based on Ubuntu 20.04 is now out. 
It might seem like an old base, but it's the result of more than a year of work to port Ubuntu Touch from 16.04 to 20.04. And it's currently only available for the Fairphone 4, the Pixel 3a and Volaphone devices, plus Android phones running Android 9 or later. It uses Lomiri, which is a fork of Unity 8, and it now uses Systemd, Ayatana Indicators, and Waydroid, which is interesting, because it might make Ubuntu Touch a more viable option for people who need to actually use their smartphones as more than just phones. x Wayland integration has been improved, the operating system also supports PIN codes up to 12 digits, it supports USB-C PD, and the web browser now has hardware-accelerated video decoding with up to 2K video playback. The camera app can read barcodes, the messaging app lets you zoom in conversations with a pinch gesture, and you can add notes and a URL for contacts. You'll also find plenty of bug fixes and performance improvements. If you already run Ubuntu Touch, you should be able to update it in place using the stable channel. And while the WayDroid implementation seems to still have a few problems here and there, it's still a major step forwards, because if you couple that with FDroid or the Aurora Store, which has virtually everything that's in the Play Store, then Ubuntu Touch becomes a pretty valuable operating system for everyone. Now, in other Linux phone news, Plasma Mobile has a new progress report. Now, they improved the brightness slider to avoid it jumping around when sliding quickly. The task switcher is now handled by Kwin instead of the shell, which should result in better performance. And there's a new quick setting to manage network hotspots. But most work has gone into the applications themselves. The AudioTube music player received a lot of work and design improvements, plus some memory usage reduction. The Contacts app now uses mobile forms to be easier to use. The Ariana ebook reader can now open files directly from the file manager. Tokodon, the Mastodon client, now handles links to ActivityPub resources. The message composer will preview the message you're replying to, and notifications can now be filtered. NeoChat, the Matrix client, now supports inline message editing, and it has a new, simpler menu and more video controls when playing videos. PlasmaTube, the YouTube client, now has rounded thumbnails, and the login workflow for your Google account has been revamped. Calendar, with a K because it's a KDE app, now supports setting reminders at custom times, and Casts, the podcast player, which also starts with a K, can now be closed to the system tray and lets you search for episodes. And you might think, system tray on a mobile Linux operating system? And that's because these applications are all adaptive. They resize for mobile phones and for desktop, which means you can run them all right now, today, on your Plasma desktop or even on your GNOME desktop if you want. Italy blocked ChatGPT on Friday, but not because they think AI poses a threat to society by disseminating false information presented with the highest of confidence, simply because it doesn't respect user data and might present answers and content that is not suitable for the user's age, as they don't verify that. They say that ChatGPT experienced a breach that exposed user conversations and payment information, which is already pretty bad, and that there is no legal basis to justify the mass collection of personal data to train those algorithms. They also said that since there's no way for the users to verify their age when using ChatGPT, it exposes minors to unsuitable answers, and as such, the program was banned. They gave OpenAI 20 days to respond to how they would address these concerns, and they will incur a penalty of 20 million euros if they don't, which is probably not that much, but could still hurt. OpenAI might have gotten a lot of funding, but it's not big tech level in terms of money. And I mean, these are not my personal concerns with ChatGPT, the fact that it blatantly presents misinformation as the right thing and will defend it to its death, even if you prove to it that it's wrong, and the fact that it's no longer open source are way more worrying to me, but I guess this might also help stop it in its tracks, at least in one country. Enterprise Linux might not be as secure as one might think, apparently, specifically CentOS in this case. Google's Project Zero, which is a security team whose job is to discover flaws in their own products, but also in other pieces of software, 
they found that some Linux kernel security fixes are not backported to certain enterprise Linux distributions. One example is CentOS Stream 9, which uses the Linux kernel 5.15. It's a supported version, so in theory it should have access to all security fixes, but it looks like it's not the case. Google's Project Zero reported three vulnerabilities to CentOS, with their usual 90 days waiting period before these are publicly disclosed. And Red Hat accepted these fixes, attributed them vulnerability numbers or CVE numbers, but they didn't fix them in time. These three vulnerabilities range from low to moderate severity and lead to privilege escalation, system crashes and more. And so now all these vulnerabilities are public and can be exploited by attackers while they're not fixed in older versions of the Linux kernel distributed by CentOS Stream 9. And what's more, the current waiting period of 90 days might be shrunk in the future, which means that companies like Red Hat will have even less time in the future to address these issues before they're publicly disclosed. And it's not a great look for CentOS. 90 days is ample time to either apply fixes that already exist to your older Linux kernel versions or to fix them yourself, even if they're not super high severity. It's, it just doesn't look good. Valve announced that Steam won't run on older Windows versions anymore, starting January the 1st, 2024. Windows 7, 8 and 8.1 will be ditched, as it seems that Steam uses an embedded version of Chrome which doesn't support these operating systems anymore. Steam will also require updates that are only available on Windows 10 and 11. Now, apparently the last holdouts for Microsoft's legacy operating systems don't represent much market share at 1.9% of Steam users, still higher than Linux users, but these will have no choice other than upgrading their computers to the latest Microsoft OS, or moving to another platform like Linux. It's a decision that makes sense, as you can't keep supporting operating systems that aren't supported by the very company that developed them, but it also means that some game compatibility might be lost, as not all titles run well on Windows 10 or 11, but they do on Windows 7, for example. And honestly, if you still use Windows 7 or 8, just don't, unless your computer lives in a completely isolated box where you never bring any new file from the internet or from another computer on it, then it's not safe, it's not supported, you should not use these systems. Now, will most or at least some of these users move to Linux instead of buying a new PC or updating to Windows 10 or 11, which they obviously do not want if they still use Windows 7 or 8, we'll have to see. But I would be surprised if we didn't see a small market share boost for Linux due to this. And let's complete this video with the gaming news. First, the AMD drivers will soon get a fix to avoid eating up so much memory. Developer Mike Blumenkrantz discovered that the RADV driver was using way too much memory, for example up to 3 gigs for Dota 2, apparently mostly to store shaders in memory, and it seems like a new Vulkan extension is responsible. The fix results in an 85% reduction in memory utilization, which means you can expect better gaming performance soon on AMD GPUs. Dolphin, the GameCube and Wii emulator is coming to Steam. You'll be able to install it in one click, although it won't provide any BIOS files or any ROMs. You'll still have to provide these to avoid any potential legal issue. It should be in early access by the end of 2023, so it's still a ways off. And it was never that tricky to install in the first place, but I guess it will make it easier to use on devices like the Steam Deck. And if you were planning to play The Last of Us remake on Steam Deck, well, it looks like it's not a great experience. You'll have to wait for about an hour on the main menu for the shaders to compile, and it fills the RAM completely after a while, resulting in a full system crash and reboot. It seems the game is poorly optimized on PC in general, as a lot of Windows users also report issues with performance and crashes. And so this breaks the streak of great PC ports from PlayStation Studios, from Spider-Man, God of War, Horizon, all were stellar PC ports that worked really, really well and had tons of options. And The Last of Us is just completely broken, apparently. But fortunately, they still have time to fix it in the future. Just like we still have time to talk about today's sponsor. 
If you need a new computer to run Linux, stop buying devices from Windows manufacturers and then acting all surprised when they just don't work all that well. Buy something that supports Linux out of the box and remove all that hassle. Tuxedo has a big range of computers from laptops to NUCs to desktops from affordable devices to really high-end super powerful workstations or gaming laptops. They are all super configurable before purchase, you can select from a variety of popular distributions to come pre-installed on them, and all the laptops are openable, repairable and upgradable for at least the battery, the SSD and the RAM, and sometimes even the wireless card. So if you need a new computer and you plan to run Linux on it, click the link in the description below and look at the devices from Tuxedo, they're really really good. So thanks everyone for watching the video, I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications, to write a comment, and if you didn't, well you can always dislike it and tell me why in the comments as well. And if you really, really enjoy the channel and you want to support it, there are tons of links in the description of this video to let you do so from LiberaPay, Patreon, YouTube membership, Super Thanks, PayPal, you decide, you know what to do. So thanks for watching and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye!